that's up and running and I'll let you those share. The live stream is now up and running. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alison. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this audit committee agenda, uh, meeting, which is on the 21st of April 2001. Uh, my name is Councillor Gerald Lee, and I'll be chairing the meeting. Um, can you show your hands when I when I run through your names? Hopefully, I'll get it. I'll, I'll, I'll include everyone. We have Councillor Baldwin, just to, so everyone can see you. Councillor Crudas. Councillor McEwen, we have Luke Swinhoe, who is a borough solicitor. We have Andrew Barber, who is a risk manager. Peter Carrick, a finance manager. Lee Downey, who is a complaints and information and governance manager. Jonathan Robson from ICT service analyst. Chris Oaks, sorry, Chris Oates. Um, uh, ITC, ICT Strategy and Operations Manager. Thanks, welcome, Chris. And we've got Alison Hill and Jill Ford from Mao Democratic Services. Thank you very much for all attending. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Chair. I think you you want to realise Michael Mason from EY. He came into the meeting just as we were set it starting up. Thank you. We have Michael wherever Michael is. Um, any declarations of interest? No, no chair. thank you. Can we approve the minutes which was held on the 27th of January 2021? All in agreement? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Item three is the ICT strategy implementation progress report. Um, who's taking that? That's me, Chair, thank you. That's Chris. Yes. That's page seven in our agenda, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So the, the report is the regular update on the continued implementation of the ICT strategy. So what I'll do is outline against the three priorities of the strategy set out in paragraph two. So if we take the first one, which is the ICT governance and ICT service development, the systems information governance group, which is chaired by the managing director, continues to oversee the ICT work plan, which represents all the current projects within the ICT service. So since the last update to members in October, ICT continued to pass the regular payment card industry compliance checks, and we've been recently successfully audited and recertified to the government's public services network compliance standard. On top of that, our internal service development programme also takes inputs from those programmes, as well as other compliance regimes, such as our information security and quality management ISO certification assessments and we continue, continue to make good progress and drive things forward uh, on the back of those compliance assessments. If we take the second priority area which is the ICT strategic architecture, we, we've made progress in a number of areas which are listed in the report in paragraph 10. We continue to manage and appreciate for our external defences through the upgrades to the firewalls and supported systems We've also upgraded our internal certificate system to secure all council data. We've increased the capacity and power of the virtual server estate and renewed the contract for the high speed network links to Stockton. Both of those services are absolutely critical as they unpin the majority of council systems. We've also continued to work with the council on the development and migration implementation of the Microsoft Office 365 suite, which has brought us um, great benefits throughout the, uh, the, the period we've all been working from home during, during the pandemic. The remaining priority area is around the, the council service development. And the way this works is that a combination of the service based information strategies and the ICT work plan define and drive the custom projects within the ICT service and in turn these ICT service projects under, under, underpin the council's business change activities and ambitions. As well as the big architecture projects, we've also completed nine service-based projects during the last six months. One example being an in-house developed replacement for the employee protection system, which was a joint development with Stockton 
um, we, we took the decision to develop something internally as there simply wasn't anything suitable on, on the open market. Uh, finally, as well as our normal activities, ICT has been key partner in the response to, to the Council's ICT con COVID-19 pandemic response. And we continue to provide our full range of services and sort of additional ones uh, as required to support the Council going forward. So, so we look to the future, ICT services will continue to help the Council retain the benefits that we've gained through mass home working and to help, the exploit, help to exploit the technology that enables opportunities and innovation that have arisen across services. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Otis. Anyone have any questions on that? No? Oh, uh, Chair? Councillor McEwen. Yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the raise hand function. Um, thank you, Chris, for your um, presentation. It, it's just a, a quick question, it, and I suppose it's not strategic, it's more tactical. Clearly, we've moved to more home working. How is supply of uh, laptops, and that I recognise that's tactical and mm -hmm. strategic. How's that panning out? Because when, when pandemic started, um, private and public sector were you know, going anywhere they could to get laptops. What's what's supply looking like now? The, the laptops themselves, Councillor McHugh, weren't were, were too bad from Dell. They had um, a, a lot of stock in the UK. Um, and once the you know, situ situation in China improved, the, 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 the main laptops were fine. Um, it's the countries where it's challenging still. Headsets, for example, have been, uh, have been a challenge. Um, it's starting to stabilise now, but it's been it, it's been an interesting year for some of the more peripheral com components in terms of the supply chain. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Okay, councillors, it is being recommended that progress on the implementation of the ICC ICT strategy be noted. Are we all happy with that? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 5, pages 11, which is the annual grant certification report 19, 2019 to 2020 on our pages 11. That's, that's mine, Chair. Peter. Yeah, thanks. The purpose of the report is to, um, to re present the re results of the external audit testing of our annual grant. As per the regulations, the council has to appoint a report and accountant, which we've appointed EY for obvious reasons that they've got access to our systems and our external auditors. There's actually three grants that they have to do now, which is the housing subsidy claim, the teacher's pension and the housing pool in return, as well as also doing the, the Homes England compliance check. As you can see from the, from the text there, the, the, the three main reports, the three main grants, there are, there are minor errors in all of them, but nothing nothing um, substantial that the auditors want to uh, bring to members' attention. I think what needs to be taken into account here, that, um, like the, the, the housing subsidy claim, that I think there was three errors but came to £12.48. There's no de minimis level on, on the amount of errors. There's the de minimis level's nil. So whatever they find, they've got to report. But again, that's got to be taken in context that the housing subsidy is about £32 million. So I don't think £12.48 is, is sort of too bad in that. And again, the same with the other two ones. There's, there's, very, there's minor, there's minor errors in there that are being put right, but no qualification letters were needed to to the um, to the various bodies. So, uh, with that, I'll take any questions, Chair, please. Councillors, any questions? Just a comment, Chair, for me. Thank you, Councillor Bob Baldwin. Uh, I think Pete is right. Twelve pound forty-eight out of thirty-two million pounds. If you bought an old sofa, you'd find more than twelve pound forty-eight down the back of it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, just to congratulate people, really, uh, that you know during difficult times we've managed to only f have an error of twelve pounds forty-eight. So, just well done to Peter and his team, really. Thanks, Chair. Mm, thank you, I, Councillor Baldwin. I think we'd I, all agree I, with that. Can I just come back to that, on Chair? It's not. It's not actually me. It's it's how it's the housing benefits team that do all that. Not not us. We the finance don't get involved. It's done by the housing benefits team. Well, congratulations to the Housing Benefit Scheme. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's quite oh, incredible. Everyone, everyone else okay? Well, it's been noted that we, we note the contents of the report. Are we all happy with that? Yes, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, moving on to page 13, which is the Ethical Governance and Member Standard Report. 
Um, who's taking that one? Is that Luke? No? Uh, yes, Chair, it is, yes. Thank you. Yes, so thank you. So this, this is a, an update report. It has less content than uh, in previous times, um, but I'll just go through some of the key issues. Um, um, we do a, an update report on issues to do with ethical health, so we monitor a number of data sets, as you know, and, and the reason for doing that is just to try and, A, give information about issues that are relevant on ethical health, but also you know, if there were ve wide variances or changes, so suddenly we had more complaints or there were some other concerns that you know were, were different from previously reported, obviously, then there'd be an issue that might need to be addressed. Um, there aren't any anything of that, that nature, so th there's a sort of normal pattern to the, the level of information that's presented. Um, the, the other thing I was just going to sort of highlight was um, uh, there's, a, there's a bit more information on um, the, the possible change to the Code of Conduct, uh, just to sort of let the committee know that um, we are looking at this and hoping to bring back a report in due course. Um, I had hoped to be able to bring a, an earlier report on the, the Code of Conduct. This, this is the Code of Conduct that's been developed by the Local Government Association and, and information is set out in paragraphs um, 7 to 11. Um, a number of other authorities in the region have been looking at it. Some have actually adopted um, the LGA's model Code of Conduct. Um, it's still reasonably early days, so we were waiting to see what, what the sort of feel was going to be like in terms of the region and the response. Um, but there are there are some issues that require quite a bit of further work. So what, what I was planning to do was to bring back a report with some comparative analysis of our current code of conduct and then what the, the LGA model code of conduct would be like and what, what the sort of variance is between the two. But that's obviously a, a big piece of work that we haven't yet been able to move forward. Um, so, so that, that that was my sort of summary. Um, but I was happy to take any questions or comments on any of the sort of content on the report. Thank you, Council. Is any questions or comments? Which um, could I could I, Council McEwney, okay? Yeah, uh, Luke, on the on the page nineteen in reference to disciplinary action relating to fraud, are we in in a uh, are we allowed to know what that that uh, fraud was? And the extent of was, was it money? Was it, and if so, was it serious fraud? I, I'll have to get information. I mean, the information comes through HR, so um, we don't actually get you know details of, of what was involved. But I can, I'll find out and I'll, I'll circulate some information to the committee. And and similarly on page 21, where we have 447 corporate complaints and 828 freedom of information. The complaints I tend to get personally from freedom of information is not so much I get the inquiry, but it's the time it takes to get a response for freedom of information. Uh, it would be interesting to have that information. It would be interesting to have that information fed into the committee. Did you see how quickly we are responding? Uh, and as far as corporate complaints are concerned, it would be interesting to know how many of the complaints are actually resolved or are they still ongoing? I see, Lee, Lee, can you help with that? Yes, Chair. So, Thank in you. relation to the freedom of information requests, there yeah. has, as you, say, you know, there has been a, a slowdown in response times <clears throat> this year, particularly as a result of a pandemic. Uh, I think Paul Wildsmith made a delegated decision in March time. You know, obviously, where we were needing to target our resources at meeting the needs of the most vulnerable. As a result of a pandemic, we weren't expecting those services to necessarily prioritise pulling out data to disclose to people over, you know, the more pressing kind of issues that, you know, we were facing in the town. Uh, so that hopefully we can produce that information, but obviously as uh, we, we come into a, hopefully a post pandemic period, we should see that, uh, you know, response improve and then less complaints. Uh, in terms of the complaints and the, the numbers that are upheld and not upheld, they're published each year in an annual report, which will go to Cabinet. It usually goes in September, uh, and then it, it's uh, published on the, the Council's complaint pages. So all that data in terms of, you know, what the issues were, how many were upheld, how many went on to what stage, all that's in that report. So, uh, you know, I could, I could point you to that, Chair, certainly. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Downey. Andrew? 
Yes, Chair. Um, just the fraud one. I believe it was um, claiming overtime. Possibly claiming overtime work for that one. Fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, councillors, we are asked to note the information and, and uh, comment as, uh, as it's appropriate. Are we quite happy with the report? Uh, agreed, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our page 23 in the agenda, which is the internal audit charter and audit planning. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is the report we bring back each year. Yep. It just outlines how we will deliver the audit service. Um, the observant of you will notice that it is one set of standards for each authority, so we don't have separate standards for either authority. It's one set of standards. We deliver the same service to each authority, so there's no differentiation there. Um, I won't go through in too much detail because it hasn't really changed from last year, if I'm honest. Um, it just goes through some of the key aspects of things like um, code of conducts, how we plan our work, who we report to, and therefore, um, I think one of the main points is about access to information. So obviously we come to members to clarify our role and the fact that we have access to all information and all officers within the council. And it's just really to get a sign off on that each year. So other than that, I'll take any questions. Questions, councillors? No, just just uh, on, on, on paragraph 19. Uh, the audit plan has been submitted to the senior management team for comment. Have we had any feedback from senior management? Papers around, well, moving things around, nothing major. They're quite happy with the plan we've got in place and the risk assessment that goes behind that plan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barber. Um, audit services activity report, page 29. Sorry, Chair. Ch yeah. Can I just ask one quick question? Of course you can, Councillor McEwen. I apologise, I never got my hand up in time. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your report. Um, in terms of uh, pandemic lockdown, have you seen any um, sort of pandemic or lockdown orientated uh, changes, aspects of uh, the plan that have been adapted to take account of the new environment we're in, etc.? Um, yes, we have made quite a, a few changes. We've added quite a few testing areas into the plan. Um, a lot of them around the grants. So we've done a lot of work on the grants that have been getting paid out. Um, so they've been added into the plan this year. Um, they'll be in for the next 12 months or so, I would have thought, until those schemes are, are closed down. Um, if members recall, we changed the way we planned our work. So we weren't doing audits as such, we were looking at controls. And that move to that process has benefited greatly because it gives us more flexibility around adding stuff in. Whereas previously, we wouldn't have really been able to add that stuff in because the plan was fixed for a year. Now we're on quarterly planning. When things like that crop up, we can just get them straight in the plan and we can get on with the work. Um, so that's we've seen quite a bit of benefit in changing the way we planned our work for things like COVID. In terms of within the services themselves, they've all adapted very quickly to the changing circumstances, to working from home. Um, a lot more information is available online now. So we've actually been able to crack on and, and get our work done still because the information is electronic rather than relying on pieces of paper. Um, so we've been able to get on, do some work without having to go into the offices, which has been positive. So I think there has been quite a change across the whole authority in terms of how the work and how they're going to be working moving forward. So I think in some ways it's been quite positive. OK, good. Can I, uh, can I make a supplementary comment, uh, Chair? Of course you can. It, it, will, it will be useful at um, a future or future meetings to get a log of what, what will be kept um, in terms of practice and what will be ditched and the reason i raise this is clearly like public private many organizations or departments things have changed and it'll be interesting to understand what you will keep going forward because there has been a bit of adaptation and, and 
and transformation. It's, so that's a request. And the second thing is, um, I thank you again, Andrew, for highlighting the the audit on the grants. It the, there has been much discussion about both the value, but the um, potential for um, I don't know whether fraud's the right word. Well, I suppose mm -hmm. it is. Uh, but to get some sort of good feedback going forward on on how that's uh, gone, because it it has been much needed. But as with any system, there'll always be uh, the potential for um, uh, wrongdoing, so to speak. Yeah. Well, the work we've done, the systems that the council put in place at the outset of issuing these grants were actually really good. Um, the work the teams did uh, the, when the grants first came out, it was phenomenal, really. The checks and balances that were in place were great. I mean, we, we did do audit work. We had full assurance on the work we did. We had no issues with the systems that put in place, the checks that were doing, the checks and balances. Um, we do have to submit a return each month on the numbers of grants issued, the number of fraud cases we've identified, and the numbers were actually very low. Um, a lot of the, the checks that were undertaken prior to any payments being made were robust and any attempted frauds were picked up at a very early stage. So the schemes themselves were very well run within the council. Very positive feedback on thank, that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Andrew, for a comprehensive re um, response. Be happy with that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor McEwen and, and uh, Andrew. Um, can we move on to item eight, which is the audit services activity report on page 29 on our agenda? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll dive straight. There's quite a bit of analysis on in the main report, but I'll dive straight into the actual activity report itself. Um, the format might be new to some members. What we've attempted to do is link our audit work into the council's strategic planning and management and monitoring arrangements. So the first page of the report looks at the strategic risk register. So as we move forward, we'll be providing assurance against each of the risks in the risk register. So the ones that have a score at the moment, they're the ones we've been able to test to date, but the other areas will be tested in due course, the building to the plan, ready to be tested moving forward. So as we can see, we've got positive assurance against the majority of those risks. Um, there's the one around the local plan, which is a bit lower assurance, but I think members are, are well aware of some of the issues around the local plan. Um, when we come to test that next time round, we're expecting that <coughs> to increase. I'll uh, move on to the next page. So one of the other things we've done is we've broken down our testing into what we call key governance themes. So hopefully some of those are fairly self-explanatory to members. Each of the controls we have in the plan, we rate based on their overall impact from very low through to very high. And we also give a result red, amber, green against each of those controls. So if members can see at a glance here that we don't really have any red areas of any concern for members. And our overall assurance levels against these key governance processes is fairly sound. I think if we're getting below around 70%, that's when we start to have some concerns. So as things stand, we don't have any areas of major concern for to bring to members' attention. Um, the next few pages just go through each service area. Again, go through in detail the areas we've tested, the results of that testing, and also planned work moving forward. Um, could, could I just interrupt you for a moment, Andrew? Could, yeah. could, 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 could we take a typical one of those, for example, on page 40 on the children's services and just, just explain that through from, yep. from, from well, everything on the, on the page, just so that yep. I think we all understand just what is actually being written and being said there. So the so first I, table... I, I've, I've used page, page 40, really, because obviously children's yeah, services fine, yeah. are very... So, so the first table on there is the overall position. So what we've tried to do with our reporting now is to always be able to give an overall picture, not just the work we've done in the previous period. 
So that very first table is the overall picture for that area. Um, so we've undertaken, uh, if my maths can work, about 19 or 20 control areas in that area, and they're the results of that work. In the period January to March, we tested nine areas. So we're giving you the results of the work in that period. Like, um, so that would give you a bit of a heads up if there's something coming out of the woodwork in any red areas. Uh, as things stand, the worst one we've got in there is, is in amber. Then the next section is our planned work for April to June. So we've got a breakdown of the number of controls we're going to be testing in each impact level and the time it'll take to test those. And then we've got that, the foot, that table's broken down to give you a full list of those areas we're going to be testing. So our frequencies range from every three months to every 48 months. Obviously, the very high ones are the ones where we, we do more frequently because they have the greatest impact. So that's the breakdown on by service area. Is there any questions on that? Just just go on really on 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 uh, below again on page 40 where we've got controls tested. We've got a long line there starting with very low, which has zero in and yeah. then low uh, up, up to and then we have towards the right hand side um, very low again. Yeah. So what's the difference between one side and, and to other? Yeah. Well, we've got we break them down by red, amber, green rating. So when we do a control now, we give it a rating based on how effective we think the control is. So the ones on the left are the greens. So we're happy with those controls. The ones in the middle are ambers. There's some room for improvement on some of those. And the reds we, is where we would have some real concerns. Yeah. As we can see for children's, we don't have any in the red category. No, I understand that now. I think it would have been easier if it had been we had a coloured version. But ah, it's all okay. black and white. Right, okay, but, sorry. But that's fine. Sorry, sorry for you to continue. Um, yeah, so that was the breakdown for each service area. Um, I'll adjust the headings on that so you can see So it says red, amber, green going forward. Uh, and then the final page of the report is our little performance summary. Uh, we'll find it. So we're down to page 52. So in terms of having adequate resources, um, the plans telling us were slightly short by two and a half days. Um, that doesn't, I'm not really concerned about that, if I'm honest, for the next quarter. Um, that's largely around a little bit of catch up from the previous quarter. Because as we can see, we, we slightly missed our target for coverage um, by three controls. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, because of the way the annual leave works in Darlington, there's quite a lot of people absent during March, so it's sometimes difficult to get work finished. But I can assure members that since the 1st of April, we've actually cleared off those three. In fact, it's more than the three. I think we've completed about 15 controls in the first two weeks of April. So that target has now been met. And in terms of the other indicators, most of them will be reported in the annual report. But we've, we've had plenty of staff meetings. We meet on a weekly basis at the moment. And we managed to submit our NFI data and our productivity levels are quite high, so it's all fairly positive, really. But I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions, councillors? No. No, thank you, Andrew. Uh, well, once again, it's been recommended that the activity and results be noted and that the planned work is agreed. Are we all in agreement to that? Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item nine, information governance Program progress report, uh, page 53. That's me, thank you, Chair. That's Lee, yeah. Yeah, so the purpose of a report, it's a six monthly report from the Systems and Information Governance Group, which is chaired by the Managing Director and attended by the Assistant Directors, uh, and it's providing an update on our progress against the Information Governance Program. Uh, so the ongoing delivery of a program continues to provide us the assurance we need to reduce our information risks to an acceptable level. And the key work we've been doing over the, the last six months really is listed in paragraph three. Paragraph three. 
So we've been preparing for data protection after the EU exit transition period ends. Uh, we've been updating our information asset registers and privacy notices, which is linked to that. Uh, we've been providing advice uh, to ensure the council CCTV is compliant with not only the data protection regulations and the Data Protection Act, but the Surveillance Camera Commissioner's Code of Conduct published under the Protection of Freedoms Act. And we've been working, obviously, which we report each time against our online mandatory training uh, information governance courses to try and ensure those, the performance against those is up to our target of 95%. So our highest area of priority really has been looking at the EU exit transition period. Uh, so if we move to paragraph eight, uh, yes, paragraph eight, sorry, on page 55. So the MHTLG, Ministry for Communities, Housing and Local Government, issued some guidance to local authorities, setting out what we should be doing to prepare for the end of the, the Brexit transition period. So SIG approved an action plan in October, and we've really been working hard to ensure that where we've got computer program suppliers primarily based in the EU, uh, they're able to continue to transfer the data to the UK after the end of the, the transition period. Uh, where we've got to at this point ultimately is the European Data Protection Board have now issued what's called an adequacy decision, which, well, a draft adequacy decision, sorry, which recognises the UK as adequate for data protection purposes. So should that be approved, we don't anticipate there'll be any issues with suppliers in the EU saying we can't transfer the data any longer or we need to vary contracts or whatever it may be to, to make sure that data processing is legal. So it's been a long and kind of bumpy road. There's been a lot of uncertainty even at a government level, but ultimately it looks like, you know, there shouldn't be any major issues. And we only have five suppliers with data centres in the EU and we've got a good level of assurance from them that, you know, they're, they're on the ball, that they've got contingency plans in place, some of which include transferring data to the UK, uh, you know, should we not be recognised as an adequate country for data protection purposes. So although that's a key bit, but it's a good news story really in that we don't anticipate there being any impact on council services. Uh, like I say, we've been updating our information asset register and our privacy notices. So this is the record we're required to keep of all the personal data we process as a, a data controller. And the privacy notices really tell the public what we do with their data. We are looking to broaden the scope of that to include all the data the council holds, not just personal data. So for example, highway schemes, things like that. And that's really to help us migrate all that data into the Microsoft 365 suite and, and kind of realise some of the benefits that can bring, which Chris has already uh, mentioned. You know, we're seeing the benefits of that now with things like Teams, uh, but there's lots more in that suite that we can benefit from. Uh, in terms of CCTV, what we've done is we've developed what's called a code assessment pack. So the Surveillance Camera Commissioner issued a code of practice and the pack is to be filled in by each manager responsible for CCTV on an annual basis. And it really gives us the assurance that their CCTV, pro, CCTV system is being operated in accordance with the relevant legislation. So it checks things like, have they got appropriate signage? Have they got appropriate policies in place around who has a right of access to that footage? Uh, and for what reason and those kind of things. So that will be reported into scrutiny uh, from a community safety point of view by Graham Hall, it, the outcomes of that, and it'll be subject to internal audit, which uh, I've discussed with Andrew to try and ensure as we move forward, you know, we've got good kind of compliance against the, the controls around our CCTV. Uh, so training and awareness. Uh, I know Councillor Baldwin's been keen to see these figures up there uh, at the 95%. So I've uh, as we can see, if we move to the table at Appendix 1, we, the first column, Employees Guide to Information Security, we've got a very low compliance figure at the moment, uh, but that's because we've launched a new module uh, in March 21. So we've updated our Employees Guide to Information Security to include some of the things like Teams meetings, 
uh, you know, the new classification we have on our emails of official and official sensitive, which is all part of this Microsoft 365 suite. Uh, so we've launched that, I think it was on about the 19th of March, and this report was run on the 31st of March. So obviously those figures reflect that being a new uh, program. So we obviously by the, the six month update, we should see a significant improvement there. Uh, social media, it's under our percentage in, in quite a lot of areas. It, again, it's a new program, but it has been in since April 2020, obviously balanced against the the impact of the pandemic. So we have raised that at the last meeting of SIG and asked ADs to, you know, kind of ensure people in their areas are, are completing that mandatory training. And then our Data Protection Act training, uh, we've got over the target for the resources uh, department, which is great, uh, housing and building services, and I think, uh, commissioning performance and transformation, but we're slightly below the target in some other areas. So it, it's a bit of a mixed bag. There is some genuine reasons as to why the figures aren't at the 95% target rate, which is really where we do want to be for all of them. Uh, but we are working, obviously, to to try and get that resolved. Uh, so the, the recommendation is that the progress against the implementation of the Information Governance Programme is noted and if anyone's got any questions i'd be quite happy to try and answer those anyone got any questions councillors no no uh, thank okay. you thank you very much thank you um, um, we agree that um it is recommended the progress with it agreed you are you? oh yeah could you hear me there? You just went on yeah, mute for a little while. No. no. <laughs> right. Can we agree uh, that the implementation on the information of the governance program be noted? Right. Thank Agreed, you yeah. very, very much. Um, are we, do we continue on stream or supplementary items, Alison? We haven't got any supplementary items. No supplementary I'm aware items. Of. No. So just on to questions. Any questions, anyone? No, no, that brings us to the end of this talk. Oh, Council Crudder, sorry. Yeah, just looking at this training that the the the, um, that the staff do and the returns on it, it, it just triggers the, the thought that, that, you know, maybe some of these things should be spread to members. I don't, you know, m members might benefit from having to uh, take some of these modules. I don't know what anyone thinks about that. And Lee, have you any comment on that? Uh, well, members of data controllers are in, in their own right, so they are responsible for how they manage people's data. So, you know, if they would, be, if members would be interested in it, you know, there's no harm in, I, know, I could run a session or we could, you know, members could access the Academy 10 training if they wanted to. Uh, you know, it's available, so if they want to use it, then, you know, by all means, feel free. Was there any, Councillor Curtis, can I just throw the question back to you? Was there anything specific within the trading well, service well, you felt would be more You know, the, the social media module, for instance, might be, I mean, obviously, councillors use social media and probably don't get, the, you know, very well trained in in, uh, in, in the implications of using it. And, the, the, you know, the employee guide, the information security i mean it's it may be something that we could offer a a training session for all councillors on that it would i think might be a, a good a good thing to do somehow I, I, mr B mr baldwin we've done things like this before with running training sessions haven't we uh, yes we have i mean you can never be too over trained, I don't suppose, because if something goes badly wrong, we can't just say, well, we've had no training. We have to make sure we get the training in advance rather than afterwards. Um, if the chair, I mean, the chair could set something up for the committee, I guess. Mm. Perhaps some sort of training that would cover a few areas to give us a broad brush look at it rather than go too in depth on everything. I think that would be a good idea. Sure. Right, okay. Sure. Councillor McEwen. Um, uh, just reflecting, I think uh, Councillor Crudus ha has a point, and 
Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with Councillor Bowen. I, 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 but but I think it's more broader. I think on social media, particularly given a much more digital type approach, more adoption of social media, um, I, I don't think it would do members uh, any harm. Whether it's compulsory, I'm not sure at this stage, but I, I think it would be helpful to offer a couple of um, training uh, slots for members on the uh, social media. But I think going back to sort of IG and data and security, I think that, you know, we, we, we all need to be um, doing that as members and that needs to be mandatory. Is, is it, I, 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 should, I should know this, I've done it, but is it, is it mandatory for IG training? I don't think so. Can anyone throw any light on that? Luke, have you any any uh, opinion on this? Uh, well, for for members, we have only a limited number of sessions that are sort of mandatory. So things like the code of conduct, and if you're on planning committee, and and certain issues to do with, you know, kind of the committees you serve on. Um, I mean, we have got quite a lot of mandatory sessions for staff. You know, obviously slightly different obligations. But um, I can raise the issue of training with Shirley with a view to you know uh, what additional training we can maybe put on for members because. I think you're right about social media. Uh, the issues are slightly different for staff, but you know, th certainly there are there are similar issues for members that you know we could all benefit from. I think, and and also for information governance. So, um, if if it's okay, can, can we come back to you on on this on on training? Yeah, seems um, reasonable, Chair. That yeah, could be looked at. Yes. Uh, who who will actually be coming back? Will it be yourself, Luke? Or, I'll speak. Or I'll speak to. I'll speak to Shirley. So um, we could either do it, you know, informally outside of the meeting, or we could bring something, you know, kind of semi-formal back to the next order committee. But I would hope to be able to do it informally because obviously that would be a bit quicker, really. So could we come back to members to let you know, you know, what what can happen as far as the issues you've raised today. Thanks for that, Luke, and thanks very much for the three of your input on on the subject. It's uh, very very helpful. Okay, unless anyone else has got anything to say, that is the end of the uh, audit committee meeting. Thank you for all who attended. I look forward to seeing you the next time. Do we have a date for the next one, Alison, or not? Off the top of my head, I hadn't. Did do, do, do it's the July? Yeah, twenty eighth of July is the next one. Does that sound right? Thank you so very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 28th of July. Okay. okay.